festival is a cultural, multicultural festival. Uh, this year we're going to showcase Ukraine, the country of Ukraine, its history, its culture, its people, its food. We are going to have Ukrainian performers um, on all three days. Just because of what's going on in the world, we want to um, share information about their culture and their people by their people. So not from social media, not from a textbook, um, but from the people that are actually there. And if you can make it over to our gallery, we've got a beautiful exhibit right here. And um, there is a lot of information here and probably a lot that people really don't understand and don't know. So um, if it were your culture, you would want people to know, you know, your truth. And so, so come on over and learn about them um, from them. You know, Ukraine, for me, I think, as someone that I was born there um, and I came here as a child, I think I've learned a lot more for myself about Ukraine just through this process. Um, and Ukraine is just this beautiful place with a really rich history, um, all the way from, you know, Kievan Rus to now that's been around for over a thousand years with its own distinct culture, its own distinct language, um, with just amazing people that just have shown resilience time and time again. It's just, you know, it's got everything from agriculture to technology to, as you can kind of see also in the exhibit, um, you know, we've got a lot of like new tech companies and innovations just even in the midst of everything now. When I think of Ukraine, I think of the values that are very dear to just about anyone I meet who is either born in Ukraine, like myself, or is of Ukrainian descent. And what is so valuable and so precious to our hearts are the understanding that we are autonomous, sovereign people, and we treasure living in liberty, and we are willing to not just talk about, but also to engage in most unimaginable difficulties to stand up for our freedom, for our liberty. And we do that in unity with one another. It is something Ukraine has been um, shown through the centuries that we are free people and will not be open to be led and enslaved by other nations of the world. Ukrainian history uh, starts with uh, what's known as Kievan Rus. Kievan Rus used to span from the Black Sea to the White Sea. Right now, Ukraine is um, one of the largest countries in Europe, and it brings with it the richness and diversity of culture, cultural identity in each region. For example, if you look in the exhibit at the Shivanka, Every region of Ukraine has its own distinct pattern of the Shivanka. Sometimes even every small village in different regions would have its own distinct pattern. And Ukrainians have been really engaged in community cohesion, in community building. People would come together in good times and in bad times to celebrate or to cry together. People would unite in, and create together. And they would work together and learn together and innovate together. Like Valentina said, there is so much innovation. And many people, for example, um, we heard of, I'm therapist, Valentina is therapist. We heard of CBT, uh, who is uh, considered the father of CBT, Aaron Beck. He's of Ukrainian descent. Perhaps a pearl not many people know. And many innovators, um, many People that have been part of Ukrainian history, sometimes that culture and has, history has been reappropriated by the enemy states. And that would be something that Ukraine stands up for to hold on to our independence, to our independent, independent thought, our independence of our opinions, of our ability to both create and to propagate the values of freedom and liberty. I think for me, it's the resilience is one of my favorite things. Um, just seeing how 
no matter what's going on, everyone just comes together and everyone just supports each other. And they're just like, what's our mission? What's our goal? How do we get there? Um, I think I've talked a little bit about just like that innovation, right? They don't let things stop them. So when roadblocks come up, when something comes up, they figure it out. Um, one of the, actually, one of the parts of the exhibit talked about like the honey of the landmines. And so um, there's fields in Ukraine that have been mined. And farmers, instead of saying, you know, oh, well, I guess we can't use them, they used drones to plant those fields. And flowers grew. And so now they had, you know, bees get the honey. So now there's honey. So they found a way around, you know, obstacles. They found a way to figure it out, to, to make things happen. Um, so I think that for me is something I've just seen. It's just no matter what happens, we just keep moving, we keep going, we keep kind of figuring it out. Um, they're always happy people. They're always happy to share their culture, share their love for things, to, you know, talk about, obviously talk about Ukraine. Um, I just think I've just met some, like whether it's here or there, I've met some of the best people that are just always just we just, we do what we have to do and, and they're happy to do it. What's special about war in Ukraine and those who are engaged in the war right now is that we never invited the war to our land. This war came as an assault on our nation, which was unprovoked assault on our nation. And People of various walks of life, be it a teacher, be it a journalist, be it a farmer, be it a, an engineer, a police person, a dancer, singer, baker, people went and signed up to become Ukrainian defenders. Ukrainian defenders are volunteers who saw the need, they stood up, and they answered because the future of their nation, the future of their children, the land on which their ancestors are buried, that future is at stake. And the collective consciousness of Ukrainian people created Ukrainian army. And they had to learn on the spot and become efficient, become well-trained and knowledgeable in the craft of um, doing this very different kind of work from what they're trained in a civilian life. That makes it very special a circumstance about Ukrainian defenders and also the impact on the rest of the population because just about every child would have mom and dad who is in one way or the other engaged in defending of the nation. Many children have not seen their parents for now more than two years. And for some for some people, it's even more because uh, the war started in 2014 and the full-scale invasion started in February 24th um, in 22. So it has been a very difficult and traumatic experience for many, many people, never knowing what tomorrow is going to bring, not knowing if the building you're sleeping in is going to have an arrival of enemy um, artillery on it. And it, in living in constant unknown and in constant risk to your life can be really draining on a human being, on any person. And this is a situation our next generation is currently living in. We have adaptation of some bunkers are created in schools, so kids continue to receive education. Not at any point Ukraine stopped educating. I want to add that one of the things that I'm absolutely astonished with is a commitment to education. Even now, through this unimaginable time, Ukraine continues to learn. Our education is taken very seriously, and academic literacy is very high. So with um, lack of resources, with unpreparedness to this kind of attack, the defender by themselves cannot work without the tools. So people of the country come together, volunteers come together, both those living in Ukraine and living outside Ukrainian borders to provide Ukraine and Ukrainian defenders with resources, with supplies, with meeting their needs to be able to survive. One of the examples um, is when I was in Ukraine, people who really don't maybe have other skills, they would help to 
do things by hand to create netting, for example, for Ukrainian defenders. People will make food and will can food and will pass it on to Ukrainian defenders. People would uh, purchase our non-profit don, purchased um, body um, heating pads and food heating, uh, heat food warmers, chemical food warmers to allow our defenders to survive the winter because winters are very cold in Ukraine and it is pretty chilling to be in that kind of environment for days and days and sometimes weeks on end. So all of us collectively coming together to make a difference is um, what's so special about the world circumstance. What it comes down to is that we live in unprecedented times and both those who are currently warriors and those who are still currently civilians are in constant threat of death. And they are staying there, they're living there, they're making choices about their day-to-day life because they live for something greater than themselves. And it is pretty amazing to read about that in a book versus to see it in the lives of just regular person of how they truly exemplify the life above self, putting priorities of the nation, of your future generations above themselves. That's incredible for me. My aunt that lives there, she's a third grade teacher. And when the full-scale invasion first started, her and her husband, they were old enough, so they were able to leave. Um, And so they spent the first few months in Poland. But then when school came back, she came back because she's like, these are my students, these are my kids. And so she went back, she lives in Kiev, so she went back, she went back to the war zone and she's been there um, educating, you know, students. And I actually talked with her this morning um, because I heard of what was going on in Kiev last night. And she said, you know, yeah, every day, twice, at least twice, three times a day, we hear sirens. And so they take the kids, you know, they have to take the kids to the bunkers. And right now school's ending in Ukraine. So all of the celebrations are supposed to be happening of, you know, 11th graders being done with school and just, it's a, it's a big deal. The start and the end of school, always a big deal. There's flowers and celebrations. And so she was telling me today that, you know, they're in the midst of planning all the celebrations while the sirens are happening, while the bombings are happening. And so kind of, but they're still doing it because school is important. Education is important. Making sure that the students at least have some type of childhood, have some of those memories, have those things is very important to them. So it's just the impact of just the everyday person and the everyday life. Um, I know another aunt that I've talked to when they were um, hitting power grids. And so they would, sh- you know, power would get shut off here and there to conserve energy. And so she lives on the 17th floor and she has a dog. You know, and so every time to walk the dog, they would have to walk down 17 floors and walk back up 17 floors because what else are you going to do? You know, so it's even like those everyday things become that much harder. Things that we take for granted here um, because we go to bed, we know there's a really good chance there's not going to, a bomb's not going to hit our house. We know that if we need to go down an elevator, chances are we'll be able to go down when we send our kids to school they're probably not gonna need to go to a bomb shelter. But this is the realities that people live with there every single day of when I send my kid to school, I don't know what's gonna happen. You know, I don't know if he's gonna get stuck in the bunker because if the raids go off, they can't go there. They can't go see them. That, that's only enough for students, right? And so living on the 17th floor, if that hits, are you gonna be able to get down? Is your building gonna be standing, right? So it's just, thinking about the everyday things that we take for granted that we don't even think about, and then adding sirens, adding the threat of death, adding not knowing if your son, you know, or your daughter, anyone is gonna come back from the front lines. Dawn was founded on the, um, the belief that people and nature and animals deserve to live um, their life free. They deserve to live healthy, happy lives. And so we saw a need of um, Ukraine needing medical aid, needing support. And so we we formed that with the belief that, you know, we send medical aid over to Ukraine, crucial aid to the front lines, to our defenders. Um, we also do a lot of work here locally to support refugees um, because I think a lot of times what happens is people forget that also once you leave the war zone, yes, you're physically safe, 
but you're not okay. People are not okay right now. And so we have partnered with different state and local organizations. Um, we provide mental health support to our refugees here. We provide housing support. We provide vocational support. Um, we also want people to know what Ukraine is. And so we spend a lot of time doing things like this, right? Like really talking about our culture, who we are as a people. When we send medical aid, we take great care to make sure that aid goes exactly where it's needed. For example, a bond box will have ICU supplies and some cardiac supplies. We do not just send the particular box to a particular hospital. We take from that box and give to particular stabilization center or the hospital only the very supplies they need. So the distribution is very intentional and very appropriate to the need, to meet that need. Also, we send medical aid, like Valentina said, to those serving on the front lines, to the medics. Many of those supplies are personally delivered to the front lines defenders. And it was astonishing to see how, for example, I'll bring, uh, say, tourniquets. They will take, take only so many, saying, I know other guys will need them also. There is no just grab and let's just store more for myself. There is true camaraderie in sharing and making sure which now that other people who will be visited will have something that they will receive that they need. People are very thoughtful about receiving the aid that they need and say no to what they don't need. And we were able to send these four air shipments of medical aid next last year. We are getting ready to send another shipment uh, coming up. We are currently fundraising. We need to raise uh, $15,000 to help us send the next shipment of medical aid to Ukraine. And with the medical aid, when we send it, also when I fly to Ukraine, oftentimes I'll bring with me someone who can provide additional services. For example, this last time, a retired army uh, medic, Adam Bradley, came with me and uh, was providing education of how to do field medicine, field mini surgeries and things of that nature. Uh, when I fly, I provide uh, education on trauma care in medical schools, but lately, mostly go to the front line and provide uh, psychotherapy care to those serving on the front lines. We have a website, so you could go to dawnus.org, and that's D-A-W-N-U-S dot org. Um, so we have all of our information, all of our events, all of our fundraisers, everything is on there. Um, also, we have a Facebook, so you can um, find us on Facebook as well as Don US. Our, um, our gallery committee, um, we got together and we were just thinking about like what are some of the most important things that we want people to know about us right all the different pieces um and i was always worried i wasn't sure like what's too much what's not enough and i think we got just the right amount um but we have everything here from our history our first constitution um to i believe which is actually the oldest constitution at least in europe if not the world um we have information about the ukrainian language um and we have an interactive um little like interactive poster. Um, basically you could press buttons, hear the different words in Ukrainian, hear the different letters in Ukrainian. Um, we wanted to really just talk about the agriculture of Ukraine because it is such a rich, agriculturally rich country. Um, and so we created this, this display here of wheat, all the different grains that come from Ukraine. Um, the map up there I created, it was really important for me to help folks understand of how many different countries in the world Ukraine touches. Because I think a lot of times, again, people think about Ukraine as just some country kind of somewhere in Europe, but the grain, the wheat goes to half of the world, at least, right? Like it gets shipped out. And this was in 2022. This was after the full scale invasion. They have continued to, you know, to, to farm. They've continued to export grain. Um, so that was really important for us. So we, we've, we talk about, as I kind of go around, we have local artists here that have donated their art pieces or their um, egg decorating or like motanka dolls, which are very traditional dolls. We have um, bandura, which is a traditional Ukrainian music instrument um, that was someone that locally can play it. I think it sounds like 60 strings um, that can play it that let us you know use that for the exhibit. So we really try to just bring um, all the different 
beautiful parts of Ukraine, like the traditional cultural pieces, but then the innovative pieces too. We talk about the technology, we talk about the sports. You know, we have um, Usyk, who's the undisputed now heavyweight champion of the world. I'm gonna keep saying that. We have his glove here, um, <laughs> you know? So it's things like that. And then also bringing light to the reality of Ukraine, right? So amongst all these beautiful things, amongst all this culture and all these fun things, war is still happening. And so we wanted to make sure like this is our culture right now. This is the reality of today. You know, if you look at the different um, Fulbright Scholar photos that we have up here, you can see, you know, like over there, you have a girl that's on a swing with a building that's missing behind her, right? That is reality. And so we didn't, we wanted to make sure that that part was not forgotten. Um, we have, you know, as we talked about like traditional clothing and different things like that throughout the exhibit, also the current modern Ukrainian wears a uniform, right? And so that was really important for us to, to communicate as well, because as Yulia had stated earlier, everyone from bakers, dancers, you know, scientists, your local grocery store worker, they put on the uniform and they go and they defend their country. So it's just, it's a big collection of just tradition, traditional things, our local, you know, kind of common current things that are going on. And then of course, a lot of it is overshadowed by, by the war. To add to about the, um, the exhibit, like as I'm looking around, so much of this was created by refugees. So there are some of us that have been here for, like me, I've been here since the 90s, we'll just say. So it's been a while. Um, but so many of the folks that are, are partnering with us, you know, for this exhibit, they're refugees. And so like, as I'm just kind of looking around the contributions um, that we have of like the wedding traditions um, and the attire was given to us by, um, by Ina Kuftun, one of our, um, a, a refugee, right? And someone that's been very active in the community. The um, eggs that were decorated were also donated by a refugee. The, just so many things when I look around, the person that was on the committee that was helping us do this, right? Also um, a refugee, right? And so they're here and they're like, and how do I give back? How do I help? How do I move forward? Um, and then just so many just different community members that have been here for so long that are just like, how do I con continue to contribute? It is not true that you need to have huge resources to be able to make a difference. Every person is able to make a difference to the extent their resources permit, be it resource of their time, resource of their intellect, resource of their heart, resource of their advocacy, of their voice, of their funds. There are so many ways person can engage and help. I welcome people to go on donus.org website on the contact page, sign up to volunteer. There are many different projects that if people wish to be engaged with, they can. Everyone can help. Um, it's big or small, it doesn't matter. I think everyone has something that they can contribute. Um, as Yulia was saying, you know, you don't have to, something I think I've learned for myself over the last few years is that you don't have to have millions of dollars. You don't have to have millions of people reach to make a difference. Um, I think everybody kind of need just finds their way of what they're able to do, and then you just go with that. So everything from... If you can pack a box, great, that's helpful for us, right? If you can repost one of our posts and get more people's eyes on it, great, that's helpful for us, right? That's volunteer work, that's advocacy, that's help. So everything and anything, um, showing up to one of our events and that's helping, right? Any of those things is helping. And so we're, you know, you don't have to just be able to write checks to help. Everything is helpful for us, right? You know how to write an email, Great. That takes time off for us, right? That's helpful to us. Um, so everything helps. Any age, anybody can help if they want to. Our gallery is located at 390 Liberty Street Southeast. Um, we are next to Marco Polo. Uh, a lot of people know this restaurant because it's a global restaurant. Uh, we're open from Tuesday through Friday from 10 to 5 or by appointment. We welcome groups. We welcome kids. Uh, we have classes. 
Um, so whatever focus country we might have, we're gonna focus on those classes. For instance, we have embroidery, Ukrainian embroidery, uh, which is gorgeous. It's just as pretty on the back side as, as it is on the front side. Um, painting, you can see a beautiful painting right next to us from a very talented 16 year old. And um, they are, they like their crown making, flower crown making, we've had a class for that. When we do have our gallery um, exhibits, we have a gallery opening and a reception night and uh, follow, our, follow us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram. We will advertise these events and the festival is at the Salem Riverfront Park. Friday, June 28th, Saturday the 29th and Sunday the 30th. Get on our mailing list. If you wanna volunteer and get involved, it's a great way to support the community. It's a great way to promote world peace. Uh, it's something we need right now. Um, we all have something to learn. We all come from a different culture and not, if not our generation, then certainly our parents or our grandparents or beyond. Um, so almost all of us are immigrants. And um, if you keep that in mind, um, have some empathy. <laughs> We're gonna learn about each other. We've got something to learn and something to share. And this is the place to do it.